contributions to preserving our history and culture, I'd like to share my thoughts on the importance of yesterday to what Marines are doing today and to what we need to do to prepare for tomorrow. I don't need to tell those of you here tonight about the importance of culture, traditions, and value in defining who we are as Marines. Our history is the bedrock of our core. From the moment that we step on the yellow footprints, we're inspired by stories of Marines at Bellow Wood, Chosen Reservoir, Guadalcanal, and Way City. We learn about the Dan Daly's, the Smedley Butler's, the John Bazalones, and the Chesty Pullers of the Corps. We learn about how important history is to the profession of arms. And we learn about our responsibility in upholding and passing down the intangible traditions of our Corps, traditions like courage, honor, loyalty, and self-sacrifice. We also learn the Marine traditions of being ready, being innovative, and being adaptive. I want you to know that today's Marines continue to be inspired by our history. I was reminded of that last month when I had the opportunity to visit Iwo Jima in commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the landing. We were fortunate enough to have 49 veterans of the battle with us in Iwo Jima to inc include Corporal Woody Williams, the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient. Each of the veterans that made the trek back to Iwo this year to include Woody was assigned a young Marine as an escort. And throughout the day, the bond between the greatest generation and the great generation of Marines we have in uniform today was obvious to all. The young Marines listened intently to the veteran stories of the old Corps, from their boot camp experiences to their combat experiences. There were also many other Marines from 3MEF on Iwo Jima last month, and Sergeant Major Green and I spoke to them. It was clear how much they appreciated the role that history has played in our Corps. More importantly, it was clear how much today's Marines look to their predecessors for validation. Many would ask me, sir, do you think the veterans are proud of us? And I'd say, hey, go over there and ask them. And then I'd watch their chest puff up as the veterans would tell them how proud they were of them and how much they actually knew about what today's Marines were doing. When I look back at the last 14 years since 9-11, I believe the performance of our Marines has exceeded any reasonable expectation. And that's no accident. Our legacy, our ethos, our culture, the intangible traditions of our Corps have been carefully handed down for the Marines on Iwo Jima, to the Marines who fought with Generals Olmsted and Shuttler in Korea, to the many here tonight who fought in Vietnam. From our Vietnam veterans, the traditions were handed down to those who fought with General Boomer in Desert Storm and with General Mattis on the march to Baghdad, and to those who fought in Fallujah and Sangin. Marines today fight and win for the same reasons that we have always fought and won throughout our history, because they don't want to let each other down and because of the high standard they hold themselves to as United States Marines. The legacy of readiness has also been passed down to today's generation of Marines. As everyone here knows, the Congress designated us as the nation's force in readiness after the early days of the Korean War. In the wake of our nation being surprised by the North Koreans coming across the 38th parallel, it became clear that our nation needed a force that was most ready when the nation was least ready, a force that could buy time and space for decision makers in the event of the unexpected. Because of the performance of the Fire Brigade at Pusan, and because we're a maritime nation, it made sense that the force in readiness should be Marines. Our culture of readiness was evident in 1965 when Marines first deployed to Vietnam. It was a factor in our performance at Grenada, Marines were ready for Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and we were ready for Iraqi freedom in 2003. We were ready in 2009 when, when Marines deployed within a matter of days when the President made a decision to increase forces in Afghanistan, and those Marines subsequently fought in Fallujah. Our culture was evident last fall during the Ebola crisis when Marines got the task to provide the initial response. They were there because they were forward and they were ready, and they were the first ones to be available for six weeks. And our readiness was evident over the past year during the evacuation of American citizens in South Sudan, Libya, and Yemen. Marines are also proud of the legacy of innovation, adaptation, and our focus on warfighting. Most can quickly talk about the evolution of close air support in Nicaragua, the development of amphibious capability between World Wars I and II, the development of the helicopter, written about by one of our award recipients here tonight, in advancements in professional military education in our warfighting doctrine in the late 1980s and 1990s. In February, we were reminded of the importance of innovation and adaptation. And I'd just like to talk to you about one unit 
that on the 11th of February, led by Colonel Jason Bowman with Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force CENTCOM, on a single day had one rifle company in, in Baghdad securing the embassy. Another rifle company was actually conducting the evacuation of American citizens in Yemen. Another rifle company was in Jordan providing security and, and training to their Jordanian Quick Reaction Force. Another group of Marines were providing a Quick Reaction Force we call a tactical recovery of aircraft and personnel with V-22s in Kuwait. And this same organization had, had AV-8 Harriers in Bahrain conducting strikes into Syria and Iraq. That's an organization built around a battalion ground combat element conducting simultaneous operations in six different countries. Colonel Bohm and his Marines couldn't have done that without the vision of those who advanced the idea of the Marine Air Ground Task Force, the V-22, and the Harrier. And he certainly couldn't have done it without well-trained and educated Marines. But we didn't give him all he needed. Despite our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan and all of our concepts emphasizing distributed operations, his force wasn't actually optimized for what it did on 11 February. His Marines just adapted and they got the job done. You know, I could go on at length about what your Marines are doing right now, and I'll simply tell you that Colonel Jason Bohm and his Marines, they're actually representative of the other 184,000 Marines we have tonight on active duty and the other 30,000 plus Marines in the reserve establishment. The Corps is in good shape. We have high quality people who have inherited those intangible traditions of our Corps. Our four deployed Marine forces are ready and relevant to the combatant commander's requirements. The only complaint that I've received about Marines since I took my assignment six months ago is there's not enough Marines and there's not enough Marines aboard ship. Many of our capabilities reflect past decades of innovation. And regardless of the task, Marines adapt to get the job done. But as I remind Marines when I go around the Corps, we're not going to get any credit tomorrow for what we did yesterday. Many leaders have described today's security environment as the most complex and volatile since World War II. And we certainly have been reminded by the events of last year to be humble about our ability to predict when and where we might expect the next fight. The Marine Corps, as the nation's expeditionary force in readiness, has to have the versatility and the flexibility to fight in any climate and place across the range of military operations. That's a tall order, and there's a number of areas we're focusing on to ensure we can deliver. Our initiatives to prepare for the future fall under three major priorities, readiness, leader development, and warfighting. I'll briefly touch on each. With regard to readiness, our approach for many years has been to focus on the readiness of those units that are next to deploy. We've accepted low readiness in our units at home station as the price of doing business. In fact, today, 50% of our units at home station are in a degraded state of readiness. It will require tough decisions and innovative thinking, but we're going to reduce the disparity between the readiness of our units that have four deployed and those that are at home station. The Marine Corps is not tasked with getting ready for the next scheduled deployment. We're not tasked with conducting humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or embassy evacuations. We're tasked with being ready to immediately respond to challenges across the range of military operations. There's an expectation that we'll be ready when we get the call, regardless of the task. From my perspective, the key component of our readiness is leadership. Today, the inventory of our leaders by grade, occupational specialty, and qualifications doesn't actually meet our requirements. And the nature of the fight has placed significantly increased responsibilities on our small unit leaders. We're initially focused on our enlisted leadership because 85% of our Corps is enlisted. We're working to increase the number of non-commissioned officers and staff NCOs in the Corps and increase the numbers of career Marines. You know, today, 60% of the Corps is in their first enlistment and 40% are Lance Corporals and below. That demographic will certainly change to account for the complexity of the modern battlefield and the increased demands on our Marines from infantry to cyber to intelligence. We started recently implementing a program that will move our infantry squad leaders from lance corporals, corporals and sergeants with three to four years in the Marine Corps to sergeants with five to six or seven years in the Marine Corps with commensurate improvements to their training and their education and broadening their experiences. We're similarly looking at the inventory and career development path of every enlisted MOS to ensure the Marine Air Ground Task Force has the leadership to meet our requirements, not just today, but well into the future. And finally, we're focused on a number of other initiatives to improve our warfighting capability. Those include taking better advantage of simulation to train, adapting the Marine Air Ground Task Force for distributed operations, and improving our naval integration and our ability to maneuver from the sea. We have a lot of work to do. 
And moving forward, I told the Marines, we'll be comfortable and anchored on the fundamentals of who we are and what we do, the intangible qualities in the culture of innovation that's honored in this museum. But we'll challenge most every other aspect of our organization, from the manpower model to the way we train to our framework for generating forces and managing readiness. Let me close by thanking you for keeping the history of our Corps alive and for supporting our efforts to make sure that today's and tomorrow's generation of Marines reflect the very best of our history, our traditions, and our culture. My commitment to you tonight is, is that you continue to preserve our history. We'll bring it forward. We'll innovate and adapt and win in a manner that will make you and our predecessors proud. Our organizational construct, our tactics, our techniques and our procedures and our equipment, they're all gonna change. But in the end, we will be clearly and uniquely recognizable as United States Marines. God bless you all and Semper Fidelis. I was uh, just advised by my uh, wartime consigliere to not respond to those uh, comments regarding hazing, but, but it won't be the first time I uh, you know, kind of did something I was told not to. I, I just want to point out that um, I, I, would, I would think we'd all agree that General Dunford's career has been, has been pretty good since that time in 1978, right? I mean, so I believe that it was the indoctrination that I provided to this second lieutenant on that day in 1978 You can, th you can thank me later, sir. <laughs> I, General Dunford, in all seriousness, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for sharing with all of us the precious gift of your time to help us celebrate Marine Corps history and heritage. Uh, we, we truly and genuinely are, are grateful for that. I don't think any of us who haven't walked in those moccasins recognize the demands on, on your time and Ellen's time and, and the time you, we have benefited from you being here. We are all, every one of us, grateful. Thank you. Um, and, and I will tell you, I thank you for your exemplary leadership of our Corps. I, I cannot imagine a, a finer officer to lead, lead the Marine Corps at this time in its history. And Ellen, thank you for all that you do every day for Marines and, and Marine families. Thank you. And once again, thank you to our awardees for joining us this evening and, and for all that you've done to help us continue to preserve and promulgate the history, traditions, and culture of the United States Marine Corps. I would ask you to keep it up, keep at it, and uh, hopefully you'll be back here in the years to come with another red ribbon around your neck, and, uh, and we would be certainly happy to see that. Our thanks to each and every one of you, our guests here tonight. We thank you for your continued support. We look forward to keeping you informed of our progress in completing this magnificent museum, this home for all Marines. And now if I could ask General Dunford, General Mattis, General Boomer, and Sergeant Major Green, Susan, of course, to uh, join me up here on the stage, as well, of course, as all of tonight's award winners. Please come on up. Uh, we would like to take one final group picture. 
I thank you, everyone, for coming, and have a safe trip back home. Semper Fidelis.